Hello everyone, today is Thursday, June 16, 2016. This is the Week in Charts. This week is brought to you once again by yours truly. If you want to see the actual game plan daily, just, uh, well right now there's not a banner on the site, so I guess if you're watching a recording of this, I'll put a annotation link into the uh, to the service page so check it out a lot are nearly all of the examples that you see good bad and indifferent and we'll talk a little bit about the indifferent and the bad in just a few minutes come directly from my trading service I'd say nearly all of them or virtually all of them okay there's a disclaimer screen as you know you can lose money trading or as I often sum it up all predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. My pen doesn't work today. Boy, I tell you. Here we go. Okay. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I started a series, the only three things that you'll ever need to become a, success, a successful trader. Easy for me to say. And I started the column, I kind of started as a column, and then it's like it was so huge, I decided to break it into three parts. And obviously, each three parts could be volumes in and of itself. And this third part, we're going to talk about the mine, methodology, money management, and the mine. And as you'll see in just a few minutes, it's impossible to talk about one without the other, and we'll touch upon each one. In fact, We'll even talk about that, too. Hello, Howard. So we've now come to the most difficult part of trading, and that would be you. The best methodology in the world is useless if you don't have the proper mindset to follow it. And speaking of the methodology, the mechanics, at least with my methodology, or pretty easy. Oh, shoot. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's a bummer. Okay. So again, hopefully we're seeing the slides now. Sorry about that. Uh, let's see. Thanks for the heads up in that. Yeah, this week we're going to talk about the methodology. I'm sorry, we're talking about the mind. So, as I just said, we've come to the most difficult part of trading, and that would be you. In the mechanics, as I said, with my methodology, they're really not that hard. True, it's going to take a little experience, and especially with the stock selection. I was thinking about this morning. It's like, well, the mechanics really aren't that hard, but there is an art and a science to the stock selection. That does take a while to learn, and that's why the course ended up being 14 hours just on stock selection in and of itself. But the general methodology is fairly simple, and wrapping your head around that should be fairly simple. And I have plenty enough education out there, both free and paid, and to get you up to speed. And then the other thing is, as I mentioned a second ago, with the trading service, you could follow along in real time with the trading service, and you could also look at the archives to see the good, the bad, and the ugly of my methodology. And I lay it all out there, warts and all. So I explain what the setup is, why I like the setup, or why I don't like the setup and not taking it. And if I do take it, give you a suggested entry, suggested stop, and a suggested trailing stop. So even if you don't know the full mechanics, if you just kind of wrap your head around what I'm doing, trading trends, looking to get on the pullback, taking partial profits and trailing a stop, if you can understand those simple things, then you pretty much get it, and then you can follow along with the methodology. Well, I don't want to get too far sidetracked too early here, but everyone on my service gets the same information. In fact, in more recent times, I'm, I'm working to, when I answer an individual email, to answer it on the service page so everybody gets that 
information too. But no matter how much I outline the game plan, my inbox fills, okay? Right before the webinar, I made the mistake of opening up my emails, and that's part of which slowed me down a little bit, among a hundred other things. But anyway, that's another story altogether. And it's like, hey, Dave, I know you said to do this and do this and do this, but I didn't do that. I did this, I did this, I did that. Now what do I do? So everyone has the same information, and some people do incredibly well, and some people fail miserably. So the common denominator is the information, but the reason people fail is because their failure to have the proper mindset to follow the plan. And I know it's cliche, but you have to plan the trade and follow the plan. So if you don't know how to plan your trade just yet, I can help you plan the trade. And to some extent, I can help you trade the plan. But as my wife often tells me when I'm like, geez, I'm trying to help these people and, and, and everything. And, and sometimes she tells me, Dave, you can't take the world a raise. And it's true. Now, here's the thing. Did I say it's Monday? <laughs> it's Thursday. See, I'm a little out of it today. We might have to just start this show over one day. <laughs> Maybe we'll do it again tomorrow. Um, I started working on a trading psychology course last summer. And I thought in three or four weeks I would have it uh, – Maybe not completely done, but at least roughed out and close enough to to, to finalize. You know, that last 10% always takes 90% of the time, seems like. And to my surprise, and I guess I wasn't that surprised, I ended up with 14 pages, and that was just a to-do list of what I needed to do to complete the course. So I realized that it wasn't something that was going to happen overnight and I shelved the project and began working on some other things in the meantime and kind of slowly have added to that over the last year. So can I cover psychology in less than an hour? Well, I think I could hit upon some very salient points. And then obviously we have plenty of these weekend charts out there. And I'm also working, by the way, to put the older ones up, the classic ones up. Uh, I used to sell those, but now I'm actually giving them away on uh, YouTube. So if you're patient enough, uh, eventually we'll get everything up. But anyway, uh, paraphrasing Churchill, a good speech is like a mini skirt, long enough to cover the subject, but short enough to still be interesting. I think he actually said a woman's skirt. I'm not sure the mini skirt was invented just yet. So I'm going to try to hit upon the salient points and at least get you or, or put you, point you in the right direction when it comes to psychology. Now, as I often say, it's impossible, or as I said just a few minutes ago, it's impossible to talk about any of these three aspects of trading without talking about the other. So if you talk about money management, if you talk about the methodology, you talk about the money management plan, and then you have to talk about following that plan. So the three are intertwined, and a lot of the uh, the audio – I'm sure the audio is fine. It's sometimes a squirrel will get his nuts caught in between me and you. There's a lot of things going on, but the recordings are very robust, so we'll definitely capture recording. You'll see it on YouTube, but uh, I, I don't know if I should holler at you to help you hear me. <laughs> uh, anyway. So you can't separate the three. It's sometimes money management things sound a lot more like methodology things, and they're all three intertwined. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken, Ecclesiastes 4.12. Now, this is a slide I, I left in from last week, and the beauty of it is if you work hard to get better at one, you'll get better at all. So if you're only trading at a small size, then you're going to survive long enough. If you've got your money management right, you're going to survive long enough until you wrap your, heads around, wrap your head around the methodology, which obviously is your mind. And then 
if you understand your methodology and you see that there are both winners and losers, but if you get rid of the losers, your money management gets better, obviously. But you see that there they are winners and you see that it might be worthwhile that your psychology gets better. And you're going to be more likely if you're getting better at the methodology to kick the stinkers out of your portfolio after they hit the stop as opposed to sit around and smoke the hopium. So now your mind has gotten better and then you're more likely to follow the methodology and then you're going to believe more in the methodology and get better and better in the methodology. And again, follow the proper money management and then it's all intertwined. In fact, I, as you can see from what I just said, it's like it's easy for me to get them all mixed up. Now let's talk about the money. Got my mind on my money and my money on my mind. Snoop said that. When it comes to the money, you really have to be able to sing like you don't need the money. Now, the question is, you don't need the money, do you? If you need the money to pay your rent or to feed or educate Junior, then you're, you've put yourself under a tremendous amount of stress. You've lost before you have ever begun when it comes to this game. So there's a tremendous amount of psychological pressures that you're putting upon yourself when you need the money. The bottom line is trading involves putting capital in the harm's way. And as well, as I reiterate, beat the dead horse again this week, even good trades will go against you. Markets back and fill, and that's a propensity we use to our advantage. Trend knockouts in a nicely trended market, okay? Market's going along, working its way higher nicely. All of a sudden, bam, we get a big knockout move. Looks something like that after a new high. We could look to get in maybe above this high and put a stop in below that low. So this is actually a market feature we could use to our advantage, now, if you have these psychological pressures put upon yourself, you're trading with money you can't afford to lose to begin with, then you're more than likely going to exit at the first signs of adversity. And nearly all trades go against you. Well, all trades do go against you, at least at the end. And I'm going to reiterate that again, beat that dead horse in a few minutes. But if you're exiting at the earliest signs or first signs of adversity, then you rarely catch a trend. I see people do this all the time. Hey, Dave, you put us in this stock today. It's down to half a point. The market was up 50 points or whatever. I, I exited by the close. Okay, that's fine. Whatever you want to do. That's, that's not what the plan was, but if that's what you want to do, that's fine. But a lot of people fail to realize by trying to contain losses, they actually create them. I've spent a lot of time talking about proper stop place, but if you go look under videos on my website and then click on more videos, recently I did two back-to-back -back week of charts just on stop placement. And the ironic thing about that is by seeking to avoid risk, many people are creating them because they're using too tight of stops. And along the same lines, if you're exiting at the first signs of adversity, then you'll never catch a trend or rarely catch a trend, I should say. And if you do, you're going to be tempted tempted to monetize that trade into paying the rent, feeding, and or educating Junior or whatever else you need the money for. 
And you're not only tempted to, maybe you're going to be forced to. Maybe Junior's hungry or the rent or tuition is due, and you're going to have to pull the plug on that trade. Well, if you quit at 20% on a trade, up 20%, you'll never make 40%. You quit at 40%, you never make 80%. You quit at 80%, you'll never make 160%. And so on and so forth. Now, let's talk about a good problem to have. What do you do? Well, first of all, I'm sorry, let me back that up. So let's say you don't have money to trade. What do you do if you don't have money? Then don't, okay? Don't trade. I'll come flat out and tell you, don't trade. You want to get educated and spend what little money you have on education. And that's going to be far cheaper than losing money under pressure. Now be warned, if it sounds too good to be true, and I quote, you can't make this shit up. Make 10 million in 10 minutes a day. And here's one of my favorites, turn 5K into 500K. So if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. That 5K into 500K is kind of interesting. It's kind of like, well, if you could do that, then take 5K, turn it to 500K, then divide that. 500k into what would that be 100 lows and then make 500k on those 100 lows and now you have 50 million dollars if i did that math right i don't know if i did the math exactly right but you get the idea okay if you could if you could just easily turn and i think they actually use the word easily in there 5k into 500k then just rinse and repeat, okay? Why would you teach someone that system? So what I would suggest you do, if you don't have any money, is take a little money you have, get educated, find a guy who cares as much about you from a psychological standpoint, and money management as he does the methodology. As I often say, I could probably make a lot more money if I didn't talk about losing trade so much. If I didn't talk about the reality of the methodology so much, like sometimes I talk about the streaky nature of trading momentum. And I've been advised by um, a fellow um, ex hedge fund manager. And he's like, Hey, you know, Dave, you're making it sound a little too elusive when you say that. Can you rephrase it? Like, well, I don't have a better way of saying it. So find a guy like me who cares as much about you <laughs> in the money management as he does in methodology. Okay. Now, this is where I was jumping ahead a minute ago. Let's say you do have the money. You're golden, right? Well, not exactly. You still need to make sure you allocate enough money to trading and just that. A story comes to mind early in my CTA days back in the, I guess it was the mid-90s. Uh, as a favor for a friend, I was not getting compensated for this. So that's that's mistake number one. Mistake number two was I traded a small account for him, and we were doing some currency trading. And we were following a, a, a pretty much mechanical system, at least initially. And we were doing we were doing fairly well. I mean, at one time, at one point, we doubled the account. Obviously, with a small account, which was a mistake to begin with. Uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, zigs and zags. But we did okay. And this gentleman only put a small amount of money in this account. Very very underfunded account. Uh, maybe my ego was a little bit bigger than I thought we could make enough before drawdown hit or whatever. But even when we were doing exceptionally well, I would get a phone call nearly every day from him. And we were following a system mechanically, or nearly mechanically, I should say. So there wasn't a whole lot to do, but every day I get a phone call and he was stressed out. 
Now, he only funded the account with, with about the same amount of money he would spend on his boat in a year just on upkeep and maybe not even including slip and maintenance, slip, uh, the slip fee. Uh, so, but this money affected him in such a way that he couldn't just, he couldn't just say, okay, we're doing this, this, this trading thing. Let's just see what happens. But instead, it stressed him out, stressed him out, stressed him out. And eventually, um, he pulled the plug. Overall, we did okay. But he pulled the plug because he just wasn't, he couldn't handle the, the ups and downs on, on a little bitty tiny account. So make sure if you do have enough money, make sure you allocate enough money to trading and just that. Now, I'm not saying you're going to piss away that money. I'm saying you have enough money in the account to where you can get your money management right, to where you can take trades as you see them. And by getting the money management right, buy enough shares to where you can flip some out. So your frictional costs don't really kill you, commission, slippage, etc. Now the bottom line is we're not we're not made to trade. Somebody just left because there's no audio. Um, the audio is fine. Just just for next week. Remember, just uh, maybe log out, log back on. Now, one thing when it comes to psychology, and this is a whole subject in and of itself, but we're not really made to trade. And the irony of that is, first of all, trading attracts the brightest minds, the hardest workers, the most motivated people. Those are the trade. Those are the people who are mostly attracted to trading, but those same people are the absolute worst traders. I know some successful engineers who are also successful traders, but either it's taken them a long time to become successful, or in a lot of cases they aren't because they're too smart and they're trying to confuse the issue with facts. And they pick apart everything, and they try to put all this logic in there. And as I'll say again in a few minutes, you're dealing with the emotions of everyone else while, of course, trying to control your own or keep your own in check, I should say. So the things that help you survive and prosper in life are the same things that might keep you from becoming a successful trader. And the biggest one of all those is just not enough time to cover everything, obviously, in the one hour. But the biggest one of all those is control, or should I say, lack thereof. If you are a surgeon, you must control the situation as much as possible, within a millimeter, I guess, in certain cases. If you are an engineer, you must make sure that that building does not fall down, that bridge does not fall down, that you've got everything mapped out exactly. But in trading, you often do not have any control. As I often say, quoting Tom McClellan, when you buy a stock, you're forming a relationship between you and the company. And you expect the company to do good things. And every, every now and then, something happens that Fs up a company because humans are flawed, I suppose, as a general statement. The CEO is checking out the secretary and saying, oh, she used to be a porn star. Maybe I could get some of that too, okay? And then the company loses, I forget how much it was, $10 billion overnight or something ridiculous because this guy couldn't control himself. So it happens when it comes to companies. Uh, people are behind the companies, and they sometimes F up. That's, that happens. You have no control over that. But you can't really worry about that. As a general statement, the corporation has a shareholder's best interest in mind. Okay. But as Tom went on to say, you're also forming a relationship with anyone who bought the stock prior to you. 
and you have no control over these people. And as Tom goes on to say, and those people will screw you. As I often say, my friend Dick Fruth over in Houston was started out as a broker many years ago when people really didn't trust their brokerages. And based on my recent e emails, doesn't look like people trust them much anyway now, <laughs> anymore now. Uh, but I digress. But they would bring in shares in to, to trade, to sell them. And the other brokers in there would snatch the shares out their hands, sell them, and give them the check or whatever, however it worked, and send them on their way. And Dick's a little bit more, I guess, gregarious might be the word type of guy. And he'd sit him down, get him a cup of coffee, and start chit-chatting with him. Why are you selling? Well, I'm getting married. I'm getting divorced. Buying a house, selling a house, whatever. And I guess selling a house would be buying the stocks to sell the house, get the money, whatever. Buying a house, kids going to school. I need the money. And rarely did anyone ever have a reason to sell that had anything to do with the company. So he got this amazing insight into what is actually going on within a market. And we don't have that nowadays because everything's just like a little blip on the screen and everything's kind of like off in the behind the curtain, like the Wizard of Oz. All these things are happening. But if you think about what he said and what he observed, people sold stocks for a variety of reasons that usually had nothing to do with the underlying company. And you got to realize the psychology with people is if a stock begins dropping psychologically, that's going to put pressure on people to sell. Why? To feed Junior, to educate Junior, to pay off some debt, to pay down the house, whatever, or to pay uh, pay the, uh, the house, though, pay the rent. So that in and of itself will put pressure, even though the company might be doing great things. The overall sentiment of the market could change. When we get to the market here in a few minutes, we're going to talk about the fact that I think the market's in trouble. And I've been saying that for about a year, but kind of uh, – Beating that uh, dead horse or beating a war drum, however you want to look at it. And in the, in the bear markets, if you guys ever been in a bear market, people begin to throw the baby out with the bathwater. They sell, and I hate to say this because I'm not a fundamentalist, but they start selling good companies. So just remember, you're forming a relationship with a lot of other people. And when I emailed Tom, I said, Tom, I quote you on this nearly weekly. And he said, I got one better for my mother, Marion. People buy and sell stocks for my late mother, Marion. People buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons. Some people buy when they have money. Some people sell when they need money. And others use for more sophisticated methods. So just remember, you have no control. Now, I did a whole show a while back. In fact, it was on April 7th, I think. If you go look under videos, and then now it's under more videos because there's so many of them on my website, you'll see the show. And some of the slides I want to use are, or taken or borrowed, I should say, from those shows. So as I often say, when you make a decision that has emotions attached, and that's uh, Damasio and Shaw have done the, the research there. So study those two. If you want to learn a little bit more about that or just take my word for it, uh, both of these people have talked about the fact that if people have been unfortunate enough to, been, to be injured or have some sort of a disease such as cancer or something that, that damages that emotional part of their brain, they could no longer make decisions. Okay. It's like I've been dieting a little bit. And I want a po' boy. Okay, For those of you who don't know what a po' boy is, it's um, French bread with a bunch of meat slapped in between it <laughs> and a little mayo or fried shrimp, fried fish. It's phenomenal, okay? But if I go out and eat that po' boy for lunch, I'm going to be sleepy this afternoon. And plus, it's going to take time to leave my office. i got a lot going on over here. I'm, I'm having a hard time keeping up with everything. So there's a stress over that. But boy, that po' boy sounds good. So all these feelings are associated, and that's just with lunch. And by the way, 
if you want to understand trading better and making of decisions, start thinking about or be cognizant of your emotions on your everyday decision and also the stress that comes along with those emotions. So here's the plan. And I could just I, I just got emails in, like I said, right before the show. I got emails in. That's part of what made me late as I was looking at the emails and amongst other things. But I'm getting emails in from people. It's like step one, this is your entry. Step two, this is your initial profit target. Step three, this is your stop. That's it. Okay, that's it. Dave, I did. I got in early and I took the profits and then I, I decided to get out. Now what do I do? It's like, well, you're making all these decisions that are not necessary. You have to reduce the amount of emotional round trips that you take. So getting back to the example from a couple of days ago, the plan was we're going to exit the stop is hit. Now you can apply a little discretion, but that's that's assuming that you're already disciplined enough to follow the system to begin with. If you're not disciplined enough to follow the system, then just follow it more mechanically, okay? Until you get good at it. In longer term, you're going to do you're going to do fine, okay? You can make a lot more money with a little bit of di of of uh, discretion provided you have the discipline, then you will follow things mechanically. But if you can't apply the discretion, that's fine. It's better off to just get stopped out and move on, okay? And then maybe down the road, as you slowly build that discipline, be able to apply some discretion. What I'm talking about is, let's say, a stock gaps against you or comes down and hits the stop and starts bouncing around a little bit, you could make the decision to stay with that position, okay? But there are some general guidelines and rules within that. But in this particular case, your stop gets hit and it keeps dropping. But you fail to take action. So now, what do you do? Well, your one decision was to honor your stop. Now it becomes two. Do you get out and risk watching the stock turn right back around? Okay, and that's going to have some emotions and stress attached to it. Or do you do nothing and risk losing more and more. And that's going to have stress attached to it. And then you're going to become the proverbial deer in the headlights. And not only stress and obsess on the trade, but miss the next big thing. I found this graphic on Corey's website, Afraid to Trade. And I need to email him and find out where he got it. I, I dug all, all around the internet, so I just absolutely think that's hilarious. You don't want to be that proverbial deer in the headlights. If you're watching the stock drop all day yesterday and now you're watching it drop further today, then you start reasoning like, well, maybe it's so overbought it's due to bounce. And so you're sitting there watching it, watching it, watching it. Instead of doing some research, spending time with your loved ones or something else, you're stressing over this trade. And guess what? You're going to be like the proverbial deer in the headlights. And you're not going to be of the right mindset. Or quite frankly, you won't be even looking. But you won't be in the right mindset to find the next winning trade. And as you can see, that could end up being a vicious cycle. I don't know if you guys have ever seen a deer in the headlights, but I live out in the country. And I've spent time in the country on and off my whole life. And that's about what they look like. They just kind of stand there and look at you. And you're like, fudge sickle. <laughs> now, let's say you don't follow your plan. Well, what happens is you end up with two or three more decisions. And with those two or three more decisions, you end up with two or three more decisions and so on and so forth. Now, this is one reason why I'm not a big fan of day trading. It's too many decisions. You look at any career or job, I don't know what you would call it, but I guess career where you have a lot of on the fly 
decisions, no pun intended, but air traffic controllers, they have a high burnout rate. Okay, anybody ever seen Pushing 10? Not a great movie, but kind of interesting um, as far as like a look into that. I'm sure it was a bit uh, embellished, but it's kind of an interesting look into that type of world. But the burnout rate is really high because you're making these literally life life threatening decisions every day and you're making too many of them. So if you're day trading, not that it's life or death, but every time you make a decision, make a decision, make a decision, make a decision, you're you're burning out your brain. And I think scientists have actually, the, the term is called burnout, but scientists have actually proven that, and I don't want to, I don't want to act like I stayed in the Holiday Inn Express last night, but it seems like I've read somewhere where when they actually study the nerves, they actually look like they've been burned on the ends. And so burnout is actually a real physical thing. And then again, let's not get, I don't want to get too far into uh, my endocrinology or, or what I know about endocrinology or neuroscience, but I know under stress, I think it's cortisol gets released by your adrenal gland, glands and it gets into your system. And all of this, I think, contributes to the burnout and the stress and negative energy. So if you're watching every little tech, living and dying by the sword, eventually you're going to get burnt out. There are some people who could day trade and it's like they have ice water in their veins and they can do it longer term and that's fine. That's great. If that's what you do, if that's what you can do, then do it and just be good at it and do it. But most people can't. And a lot of people think they can, can only do it for so long. So be warned. I don't want to jinx you if you're successful at it. If you're successful at it, keep doing it. But maybe in the back of your mind, figure out a way to kind of broaden that time horizon a little bit, maybe to like intraday position trading. That's that's a little bit better. I watch hourly charts in Forex. And if I take a trade, I might be in that trade for days and days and days, maybe even weeks. OK, that's a little bit different than in and out, in and out, in and out like that rat hit the button trying to get his cocaine over and over and over again. So you have to reduce the amount of emotional round trips that you take. And as I've said a thousand times, I think it was Montier that said you have to plan while things are static. Well, I, I'm saying plan while things are static. But his point was that stress increases when information is changing or uncertain, okay? Well, you don't know what's going to happen next, but at least when the market's closed and if you're like me, you're drinking that big cup of coffee and you're looking at your charts and just kind of chilling out, excited about the next day because maybe you could find some opportunities. There's not that tremendous amount of stress upon you, but if you're if you come in the next day and decide you're going to wing it and not follow your plan and watch the stock trigger an entry but not do anything and say, well, let me see if it comes back down or let me see if it – well, if it goes up, no, it's going up too high. Let me let me do this or you start making all these other decisions, then you, you fall into that vicious trap. So plan while things are static and that information is not uncertain and not changing. Everything's static and then relax. I know. Ha-ha. But work hard to let things unfold while following your plan. As I often say, I have some friends that are mechanically oriented. I don't think they're mechanical traders, but they're mechanically oriented. And a lot of things they do publicly is like, hey, I have this little mechanical system. But I think in reality, they're a lot more discretionary than they admit. And a lot of those same people, as I've said a thousand times, they tell me that I'm a lot more mechanical than I let on to be. And maybe I am. Sometimes I see certain signals that just take them. Uh, sometimes I, I, I'll cuss and fuss, but I'll let the stop take me out of a trade. And I try to reduce the amount of emotional decisions that I make. I remember one time my wife came to my office and I had a bunch of positions on. I was doing really well. And uh, I'm like, I'm not sure what to do. And she goes, well, what would Dave Landry do? And she turned on the heels, walked out, and closed the door to my office. And 
I kind of growled a little bit. I'm like, well, yeah, what should I do? And just follow the plan. And I know, I know. It's easier said than done. Plan the trade and follow the plan. Get sandwiches delivered. That's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> I live in the middle of nowhere. It's not the end of the world, but you can see from here. In fact, if you're going to come visit, you better bring a sandwich um, for, for you along the way and for me when you get here. Now, here's the thing. Like yesterday, for instance, we got stopped out of one. I dropped an F-bomb. Yes, I'm human. I get excited. I'm kind of emotional. I cry like a schoolgirl in a Nicholas Sparks novel or book or uh, whatever, uh, movie. Been forced to watch one, so I'm I'm an emotional being. And I dropped an F bomb yesterday. But by the end of the day, one of the other positions came back nicely, and overall the portfolio ended in the black for yesterday. So I wasted some mental energy on that, even though the day turned out okay. If I'm a position trader, then whoa, the zigs and zags intraday shouldn't bother me that much. In fact, the zigzags day over day shouldn't bother me that much. A client called me recently and uh, he said, Dave, when you when I first started the service and you said, eh, we're down a little bit here, no big whoop, we're down the day, no big deal. He said, it used to aggravate me, but now I see a lot of days you're up big and you're like, eh, we're up, but no big deal. And I'm probably a little bit more, admittedly, a little bit more emotional than I might sound in that nice, calm service. Uh, video that I do every day because by the time I get around to doing the video, I've already done the research, I've already seen what's happening in the market, and I'm in that relaxed, calm state. But you do have to reach a point where you are in that relaxed, calm state to where you're not worried about the zigs and zags and you're focusing on long term. Now, I've said quite uh, this quite a bit. I've never been an unsuccessful paper trade, and that's straight from the layman's guide to trading. And once real money's on the line, things begin to change. The market may encourage you to take small profits before they evaporate. I, I, I try to avoid getting into the bad teacher speech, but it's nearly impossible. Every time I talk about psychology, the market's a really bad teacher. You get into a trade, you make a little money, bam, you lose it all. You get into a trade, make a little money, bam, you lose it all. That happens 10 times in a row. You get kind of frustrated or five, let's just say five times in a row. You get a little frustrated. One to six trade. Uh, you know what? I'm going to take that little profit. F you market. I'm going to put that money in my pocket. Well, you put that little spare change in your pocket and what happens? Stock takes off without you. It would have turned into the mother of all trends. So a lot of times you're encouraged to take that small profit before it evaporates. A lot of times you get into a trade, it's a losing trade first day in, second day in, third day in. And you're like, you know what? Forget this. I better get out because this is only going to get worse. I hadn't gotten stopped out yet, but this is only going to get worse. Or as I often, it's I was putting together all these old videos. It amazes me how many dead money reports I put out there. Dead money, so-called dead money is money that has no chance of ever making a return. Well, if you do that, then absolutely exit a trade, but you don't know what's going to happen next. And as long as you have some parameters in place that are within reason, that stop is outside of that normal volatility, then what should you do? Well, you should follow your plan and stick with the trade, good, bad, and indifferent. So many times this dead money stock eventually takes off and obviously people give up. We had one, my favorite example ever. We had a stock that made a little bit, came back in, and was absolutely flat for about a month. But longer term, the chart still looked pretty good. It was just consolidating. I wouldn't buy it as a brand new trade into the consolidation, but as a trade already in, stick with it. Follow the plan. And then the stock got bought out. Well, I guarantee you 99% of the people in my service, or 95%, maybe half, uh, let's just, let me give them a little bit more credit. I'd say half other people probably exited long before that stock got bought out. Now, some of the people probably exited because they didn't have enough money to trade. And they felt like, well, I could bail on that position, and that's going to free up a slot for another position because they really don't have enough money to trade to begin with, as we just discussed earlier. But the other half got out because they were outsmarting the market. 
and they thought that just because the market didn't move in the time frame doesn't move doesn't mean does mean that the market will never move and the market doesn't move in your time frame and sometimes it'll take off without you be a bad teacher holding on to losing trades i was i, I was gonna say i just got back from hong kong feels like and i'm just recovering from it uh that was a tough trip but i got to, i got to hong kong and and i met a gentleman who was going to be in the uh in the presentations that I was doing, um, and he was a fellow trader, and but the Hang Seng was down 30%, and so was he. And, and he said, "Well, I can't sell now. I'm down too much." It's like, well, yeah, that that'll that'll work until it don't. So what happens if it goes down 40 or 50% or more? Nasdaq went down 80% in 2000. I'm sorry, 70 something percent in 2000. 70, 80. You get the idea. So a lot of times you get stuck in a losing trade. You just keep holding on and holding on. There is a chicken versus the egg conundrum when it comes to a methodology and the psychology of following that methodology. The map is not necessarily the territory. As I've said, ad nauseum, people will send me systems that have 50% drawdowns. Okay. All right. That's a little steep. But let's say that that's the worst that you'll ever have. And trust me, if in hindsight it has a 50% drawdown in the future, it'll probably be worse. But let's say that it'll never get worse than 50%. Well, when you're down, when you've lost half of your money, will you continue to follow that system into a hole? I don't know. Maybe you have that mentality. They have, there have been, and I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but there have been some people that have and have made a lot of money and then eventually blow, blew up, okay? And you can read about these people. If you contact me offline, I'll, I'll point you in the right direction. I, mean, I, don't want to, I don't want to make it sound like I'm being negative because what they did was pretty amazing. Unfortunately, sometimes it's, it's important to, to hold on to something, but the reason they made it in the first place is because they were flippant and didn't care about these huge losses. So you don't know how you're going to react until you actually do it. A lot of people, yeah, I told my wife last night, um, she says, what's going on? I said, well, I was a little bummed out. We got stopped out of one, but another one took off and it kind of balanced it out. In fact, we actually made money. For the day she goes well that's good i said yeah but um she goes well what's wrong you know did you make money or don't you feel good i was like yeah but you know people probably bought the losing trade and are still holding on to it and didn't bother taking the winner trade for whatever reason because people can't follow a methodology or people at least have a hard time following a methodology and the way you get good at following a methodology is to follow methodology. Okay. <laughs> um, as I said last week, money management will, will cure a multitude of sins. It's the JB Weld of trading. As I said last week, JB Weld can can cure a multitude of sins if it comes to when it comes to you breaking something. And I talked about that last week. Uh, making the plan mechanics really isn't that difficult. Following the plan obviously is. And as I often say, you are the only thing that really stands between you and your success. The old Pogo comic comes to mind. We have met the enemy, and he is us. Now, as I said last week, or recently at least, every trade is going to end badly. One of three things is going to happen. You're going to get stopped out at A, a full loss, or a partial or, or near loss on the trade. So you get in a trade, you're feeling pretty good, market takes off, and then comes back in. You might try to stop up a little bit, but you lose, okay? You might get a swing trade out and then scratch out, or maybe even a little bit more to scratch out. Or you might get into a longer-term trend and then stop out in the end. 
again, I probably this stop should probably be a little bit higher, like right there. So it's a little bit better trend. But you get the idea. All trades are going in in badly at some point, and that's why. Again, I can't separate the psychology from the methodology from the money management, but that's why you need money management. And psychologically, you have to let that money and position management work. Now, as I've said ad nauseum, you have to obsess before you get into a trade and not afterwards. And everyone does just the opposite. I guess I shouldn't complain too much because I wouldn't have an educational business if everybody listened to what I said my educational business, right? And I am occasionally a victim of my own success on the educational side, which is fine. Some people will say, well, Dave, uh, you've taught me well. I'm doing really well. I'm going to move on. It's like, well, keep me on staff. Treat me like an institution, okay? But it is kind of rewarding, even though in some cases, even though if you actually listen to me, I, I run the risk of, of, of working myself out of a job here. Now, before you make a trade, to trade or not to trade, you just need to honestly ask yourself a few things and be very brutally honest. Are the conditions generally conducive? Right now, the answer to that question is no, flat out, okay? But if they are, meaning that the market's going higher, the sector's going higher, the stock's going higher, most stocks within the sector are going higher, then what should you do? You should trade. OK, no. If the answer to that question is no, are conditions conducive? No. Then what do you do? Well, if the market looks like electrocardiogram and the sector looks like an electrocardiogram and the stock looks like electrocardiogram, then don't trade. OK. Now, if the stock does look OK and the market in the sector and the stocks within the sector don't look so great, you got to ask yourself, do you think you have the mother of all setups? And if the answer to that question is yes, then you trade. We have one stock that I'm sure you guys are going to be all over because it's got Dave Landry written all over it as far as a setup. It's TKO. I had it on my Landry list last night. We're not going to talk about it. We'll talk about it next week. But we're, and you'll see it next week if you look at the delayed service, either on my homepage or if you sign up for the delayed service, you'll see it next week. But the reason I didn't take the trade was I didn't think it was worth it based on the underlying sector and market conditions. So if conditions aren't great and you don't think you have the mother of all setups, then by all means, don't trade. Walk away, but be okay. Now, truth be told, I took a peek at this stock this morning to see if it was taken off. And if it would have been taken off, I probably would have been a little aggravated but I did tell myself last night I could walk away and be okay. So if it does take off, I'm just going to have to say, not be frozen and go, oh, that's a bummer. I have to just let it go. Now, as I talk quite often, I'm always talking about the importance of money management. A good defense is crucial, but again, you want to pick the best and leave the rest. I think Papa John... Could probably be a good trader, better ingredients, better pizza. And as I often say, garbage in, garbage out, or as I began saying last week. So just make sure you have the best stocks to begin with. And make sure the stock is trending. And ideally a persistent trend. And ideally a persistent and accelerating trend. And then make sure that if it's a knockout, the knockout move is meaningful. If it's a pullback, it's deep enough. Okay? Make sure... The bottom line is it doesn't look like an electrocardiogram. Now, the question is, how do you know what you're doing wrong? Well, I'll tell you how you know what you're doing wrong. Give me a phone call, and I'll ask you. We're running kind of long here, so I won't go into too many anecdotes or any anecdotes, but every now and then somebody will call me all bummed out, and they'll say, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. And I ask them, they tell me. But usually they'll call me and say, hey, Dave, I'm not honoring my stops. Hey, Dave, I'm taking profits too early. Hey, Dave, I'm taking mediocre setups. And it's kind of like doctor, doctor. It hurts when I do this. You know, wiggling your elbow a certain way. It's like, well, don't do that. I think Livermore said it best. Uh, this is a slide I've I put together for my beginner's course a few months ago. 
and I've been using it in nearly every presentation. A speculator sometimes makes mistakes and knows he is making them. Okay, lots and lots of questions. Ah, see, I just, uh, Angela says, okay, I just sold my GBT. Good. GBT was the one I was talking about earlier that uh, stopped out and should have been exited. Ultimately, you choose your own investment odds. I think that. I think you're correct. Do you still think there's only one reason to buy and that it will be to go up or too many games are played behind the scenes these days from Matt? Well, there is obviously flash trading. But I think that, and, you know, before there was flash trading, there was this spread trading that you guys and girls – probably never knew existed. And the only reason I knew it existed is because I had some friends on the institutional side that told me about it. Okay. And they were spreading these markets against these other markets and using a tremendous amount of arbitrage. Well, before they invented the flash trading, they would hire, literally hire somewhat kids, young folks. Okay. And one of the things they asked him was, do you like to play video games? Because those are the kids who could act fast enough at the trade off of these spread relationships, these arbitrage relationships. Well, flash trading probably eliminated those guys, and it's the next big thing. So I don't know. Uh, anytime something happens in the market, use it to your advantage. The flash trading creates liquidity. And in a lot of cases, it creates persistency. So use the liquidity and the persistency to your advantage. I'm a big fan of free markets, although I do have to say I'm not a huge fan of the flash trading. Okay. And it's maybe I'm jealous because they're, they're making so much money, which seems to be fairly consistently. Didn't some firm get ready to come public and have like 999 Profitable days and just one losing day. <laughs> and then when they went to the public and the uh, SEC is like, what the, what the hell, you know? <laughs> what are you guys doing over there? Because nobody is that right. So I, I do think that if you're willing to buy a stock that you have to, you should, you should have to honor your bid for one second. Now, maybe I'm just scorned by all of this. But I think I think that's legitimate. One second. You have to honor your bid for one second. And that would, as I talked to one of my friends over in England uh, when I was in um, Italy, when the flash trading was first rising up, and I said, what about a one-second bid rule? And he said that would, no that would knock out 98 point something percent, if not all, close to all of the flash trading. So I think that – I believe in free markets, but I don't think you're constricting the markets by requiring a one-second bid. Um, Rule. And here's the other thing, too. Even if you think flash trading is affecting the markets, it's not going to affect the little biotech stock or the little IPO, for the most part, these smaller cap stocks that we're trading. And on the downside, these larger cap stocks that we trade, usually, just for those of you who are not familiar with the methodology, on the short side, I, I as a general statement, I tend to, to like uh, – Somewhat bigger cap stocks, and on the long side, I like smaller cap stocks. Well, on the short side, the flash trading, I think, could actually help push those stocks lower uh, on the short side. So I don't want to digress too far into that. If someone told me that when I started, it would help me a lot. It took me over a decade to learn to go and get profitable. I was a business owner and controlling personality. Thanks for being honest, Dave. Rare in this business. Well, the thing is, the thing is that there are some scumbags out there, and and I don't have all the answers. And and I think I think what makes me and I don't want to blow smoke, blow my own horn. I guess if I could, I would never leave the house. But anyway, I digress. I don't want to blow my own horn, but I think. Part of what makes me a good educator or a decent educator is the fact that that I go through these same exact struggles that you two, you do, and I feel these exact same effects, exact things, and and I have these same exact emotions. Okay, the problem that 
a lot of people have, if, if in life you try something, you don't succeed, you try something else, you try something else, you try something else, you try something else. So here we come back to the fact that markets in life weren't necessarily the same. You may have tried something in the markets, but tried it at a really bad time. You may have tried momentum trading when the market's trading sideways for years or chopping sideways for at least months. And you're like, hey, well, nobody's going to wait years, obviously, because they move on. But let's say you tried it for a few months, uh, middle of summer, choppy markets, couldn't make a dime. Well, this is not for me. So you start trying everything else in the world. Well, 10 years from now, you come back to momentum trading and say, okay, Dave, tried everything in the world. Let's start from scratch again. It's kind of like when you reach the beginning, you reach that true enlightenment. No methodology works all the time, but people end up perpetually out of phase because they think they, they've got to just keep trying things at the, and, and, and trying things. And, and what's worse is, as I often say, let's say somebody comes in during a momentum period and we're printing money. They think it's always going to be that way. That permanent income hypothesis rears its ugly head. OK. Dave, you follow the KISS principle with the emphasis on the second S. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm uh, what's my nickname? Trend following moron. Boy, I was upset when somebody called me. I was, I was bummed out because I know who it is. I'm 99% sure who it is. And it's someone I had utmost respect for. And it's somebody who was emailing me and telling me how great I was and blowing that smoke up my uh, rear, making me feel fantastic. And then all of a sudden they short something that's going up and I'm publicly saying it's going up and it continues to go up and I'm drawing my arrows and they tell me what to stick. They use an anonymous email, tell me where to stick my arrows and call me a trend following moron. And that stuck. Livermore went broke, what, three times and shot himself. Is that success? Eh, no. <laughs> well, people... The people who who, uh, who have really studied Livermore and, and sort of defend him say that he that his his family was cursed or there was a disease. I think his uh, a lot of people in his family shot themselves. <laughs> so uh, the the people who defend Livermore say that he was. Uh, it was an illness that caused it and not necessarily the ups and downs of trading. So that's, that's open for debate. And I don't, I'm not going to defend Livermore, but whether he was, whether you consider him a quote unquote success or not, he was, you can't argue that he was successful at least for periods of time. And then you can't argue with his logic on trading and what he did and the psychology of the market participants and the amusing anecdotes. I mean, there's there's so much information there. Now, I shouldn't say this, but there are some, and they're dead. But there's <laughs> there's there's some people out there that are following these arcane methods from these people who are no longer with us, and and the people with the arcane methods who created the methods were never successful at it. And sometimes I get asked about these people and, you know, they could, if they couldn't make it work, what makes you think you can make it work? Okay. And again, I don't want to digress too far. I get my ass handed to me quite often. So I don't want to sound like I live in a glass house. If you don't need the money, there is no fear. Well, well, the problem is it's your perception of the money, too. So like the aforementioned person to put a small amount of money into a um, small account, he couldn't, he couldn't stand the ups and downs. I see multimillionaires that open up a small account. They blow it up. They feel like they're destitute, even though they have, they feel like they're homeless, even though they have plenty of homes. I'll probably write about that tomorrow a little bit in my column. 
And it's kind of a rinse and repeat. It's kind of like a vicious cycle. They just keep blowing up. Where it, whereas if they put enough money into an account and psychologically said, this is my trading account, I'm going to follow the plan, I'm going to follow the solid money management, I'm going to grow the account, and this is my business plan, just like I have a business plan for my real estate dealings or my medical practice or whatever else, then they would do just fine. But even just because you have money doesn't mean that you don't have a certain way of looking at that money that you could allow that money to work as it should and follow the plan as a trader. So even if you have money, you're just going to have, you're still going to have to develop the proper mindset and have the methodology and have the money management, all three intertwined again to make it work. All right, let's jump into the chart Ch charts. Okay. My friend Ed did that 5,000 to 12, maybe to 12 years. But it was a bull market commodity in the late 70s, not recommended. Um, yeah, and, and, re and I often talk about that. Uh, if you read my last column, which is on the homepage right now, I watched a friend turn $5,000 into roughly a million. And then he ended up homeless and on my doorstep. You could do these things, but not without a ridiculous amount of, of risk. So you've got to be really careful at doing that. And you also, like I said earlier, you have, you have to have a very flippant attitude and just kind of like go balls to the wall on these things, okay? Like Larry Williams, when he won a trading contest, not to take anything away from him because it's a pretty amazing thing that he did. He went from, I think, 10K, real money, and he won a contest at the end of the year by having a million dollars. Well, it helped that conditions were conducive for his methodology. I think he was doing like opening gap reversals at S&P futures or something like that. And he parlayed that money up. But as he says in uh, one of his videos, he says, well, towards the end of the year, I was up $2 million. So if you ask my wife, I tell everyone it's a year I made a million dollars. And if you ask his wife, he said, that's the year that Larry lost a million dollars. So all these stories are fun and exciting. And it was fun. I, I, was, I hung out with this guy, boats, cars. Uh, he was living a life for a while there. And you know, he's no longer with us. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, he went living more. <laughs> Uh, he did exactly. He he put a bottle to his head and pulled the trigger, but he didn't he did pull a, put a gun to his head. But you know the end result's the same. Anyway, Frenchy says it's like any other business. In order to grow and stay motivated, you have to act like you're starving even even after your successes. Eh, yeah, stay hungry. No matter what you do, you need to stay hungry. I agree to that. All right, let's take a look at the overall market, and uh, we could. I'll keep asking answering these questions uh, as we go through these charts. Um. One thing that I'm seeing is internally, there's a lot of problems. Now, before we get that to that, let's let's just kind of zoom in on this uh, on the piece here. And what was kind of interesting is while these I don't follow a lot of people, but occasionally I'll peek into a forum, and occasionally you guys will send me some stuff. About what other people are saying, and I have enough to keep what I'm up with on my own. So, I mean, it's okay if you do that, but you don't, don't feel, don't feel um, inspired to do that. In fact, I, I, I try not to cloud my judgment with, with too many other people's judgment because the problem with doing that is if I respect the person, then, and I disagree with them, then it kind of messes up my judgment. If I respect the person, and agree with them, then I might be a little too full of myself because I respect this person and they have the same uh, mindset as me. But the point I'm trying to make, believe it or not, I have one, is that while this market was just kind of creeping higher in here, I saw a lot of people getting bullish. And there were some systems that were triggering, triggering on the bull side that they were pointing out, and that's fine. But I had a hard time getting excited about a market that's just kind of creeping along in here and barely working its way higher. The reason being 
is that a couple of big down days wipes out all of those gains. So notice that the market went from here to here, and then two or three days later, it's all the way back. So it only takes a couple of big down days when the market's just kind of creeping higher. And then obviously today, a little weakness coming in, and now we're down here all the way back to where we were way back in in April, maybe? Maybe even March, all the way to April. Let's keep going. Let's see how far we can go. In fact, it might be easier to do it like this. Yeah, we can go all the way back to March, and we haven't had a whole lot of forward progress. Let's see if we can. Let's see if we can get a negative here. Well, there you go. So you can go all the way back to March, and and again, never forget about the net net price change. We're actually down from where we were way back in March. Yeah, it creeped higher for a while in here, but now we're down. And yes, we've worked our way up from the lows, but as Janet says, not uh, yelling, but the other one, what have you done for me lately? And so far, the market's kind of rolling over. And as far as I'm concerned, a market needs to be making forward progress, especially in an uptrend. Otherwise, it's it's losing steam and losing momentum. And you can go back in the presentations over the last several months. A lot of times I'll draw an arrow that goes kind of straight up in here, and then it just kind of rolls over and goes sideways. So even if you didn't know anything about technical analysis, you could certainly say, well, this market really hasn't made any forward progress since when? 2014, at least on a net-net basis. Now, it gets a little uglier in the NASDAQ which, as you know, is a little bit broader, more broader, broader base, he tried to say, than the S&P 500. And NASDAQ down a little bit more than a half percent today. Eh, no big deal, but you have to stop at some point. And that's a fragile nature of a market that's bumping up against some resistance. When a market climbs back up to resistance, and this is just human nature. This isn't a, a Fibonacci or a wave count or a, a bar count. <laughs> Scrunchable. Um, type of thing. This is just me looking at the chart saying, okay, lots of overhead supply. People have likely either bought or held the stock stocks at that level. And if the market gets up to that level, they may be inclined to get out of break even. Now, as long as the market keeps going higher, they'll be more and more inclined to just sit on their butts and hold on to their positions. Unfortunately, what happens is if a market begins to stall out, like we're seeing here, they begin to dump their positions, as we may be seeing now. The rusty out of all of these remains the worst. Shorter term, it, it had a pretty good run in here. And a lot of people, I saw some uh, some people get lit up like, oh, look at that. That Russell is taking off in here. Looking pretty good. Going to get a small cap rally. And then we've come all the way back in below this breakout. And again, in a Russell, it's a forest for the trees thing. You can go all the way back to 2013. And on a net net basis, we haven't made a whole lot of forward progress. I think maybe last thanks to Thanksgiving 2013. Let's see if we can get that on here real quick. Anyway, you get the point. Okay, percent to there you go. Negative since uh 1127 13. So that's not a good thing. And then to those of you who have studied trends at the trend following moron school 101, know that that market sort of looks like what? A bit of an electrocardiogram. So conditions aren't necessarily conducive right now. And that's why I've been so damn selective. And a lot of times saying, hey, guys, let's just sit on our hands. Um, you could see these... Uh, a lot of these stocks or a lot of these sectors have hit new highs and then come back in. Let me answer a couple questions. We'll get an update real quick, and I'll show you that. The, the point is that that areas are either in downtrends and resuming them or they're bouncing off the top. It is success, Dave, because he did miss when he shot himself. Who missed? Livermore missed? I think he eventually hit it, though. I think Livermore's final wife had all five of her husbands commit suicide, if memory serves. Whew. We're not going to open up that can of worms, are we? 
Oh, man. <laughs> Oh, there's something I could say. My wife has a comment that I don't know where she got it, but whenever there's a woman who's recalcitrant, uh, she has a, a saying about what that woman must have, what she must possess to keep that man around. If you don't really need the money, I think you have less of a tendency to force an opportunity. Let me think about that. If you don't really need the money, I think you have less of an opportunity to force an opportunity. Yeah, you know, that's one of the things I often talk about is intuition versus into wishing. And if you really need the money, then you try to make something happen. And that's another thing that I'm glad you mentioned that because it's something that I didn't even get even didn't even think about covering today. But I, I talked about if you really need the money, you're gonna exit too soon on your trades. You're gonna be forced to do that. But you're also going to get into mediocre trades to begin with because you're going to be like, well, I need some money to feed Junior, so I better make a trade. I can't just sit here and wait for things to get better. Maybe this is a good enough trade. Okay. Well, the market's good enough doesn't work. Maybe if you're taking partial profits like the one I showed last week where it's within – a few cents of the partial profit and you're going to make eh, 0.9% versus 1% for that one trade. Good enough is good enough. But going into a trade, good enough is not good enough. My father-in-law, um, he's kind of tough older gentleman. And, and as he taught his, his daughter, my wife, Marcy, it's like, if you have to ask if it's good enough, it's not good enough. Okay. And yeah, he, he probably make a good trader because it has to be good enough. Okay, uh, Carol, we'll get to that. Let me just show you real quick these media groups now that I've got them updated. Um, this is what I call the major MIGs. And you can see some of these areas like insurance came up to new highs and bounced right off of them and have rolled back over. Defense made new highs, not the end of the world, but kind of rolling back over. Computer hardware made marginal highs, roll back over. Semiconductors, marginal highs, roll back over, back below the breakout. Okay, same thing, computers, software, drugs, rolling back over. Health services, one of the strongest areas out there, and this is why sometimes, even though I'm a huge fan of relative strength trading, momentum trading, but this is why sometimes you don't go after the only area in town unless something really knocks your socks off because notice you may do highs, but then you've already come back in. Manufacturing, same action. Materials of construction, same thing. Leisure down here near new lows. Media near new lows. Telecom at new lows. Retail, not making much forward progress. Uh, All-time highs here, but then what have you done for me lately? And not so lately. So as you go through these, you can see over and over again, a lot of areas made it to marginal new highs, but have come right back in. So not looking too good internally. All right, let's open it up for individual stocks. Sorry, I ran so late. Uh, gold, the commodity is being asked about. Opening gap reversal today. Uh, gold's been tough. It's always tough to trade these very efficient markets, obviously. Uh, if it could keep breaking out and then pull back, then yes, by all means, I think gold uh, could be worth a shot. But right now, so far, it's coming back in. But as a general statement, it has improved. Uh, we'll take a look at some gold stocks, too, in a second. Penn. In fact, we can look at gold. The, um, this stock, at first glance, looks a little wide and loose. Um, notice that it's just barely getting past the prior high in here. It's kind of wide and loose. Uh, I think I would pass on this one unless it really busted out to brand new highs and then maybe on a pullback. Let's take a look at gold, the commodity. I'm sorry, gold of stocks. Morning store industry groups. I can find them. Talk amongst yourselves. All right, gold, the stocks have kind of traded sideways in here. And it's been kind of tough, as I've been saying quite a bit. I know it's maybe an excuse. But it's been kind of tough to get on these gold stocks because they took off in here and then they lost momentum. 
Okay. And then they kind of took off again and then they, they gave back a lot of those gains. And then you got gaps higher and then now it's trying to take off again. So it's been a wild ride in gold as it can often be. But I'm a little disappointed that we weren't able to really get on gold uh, very well. Arsene wants to know about PDEX. Uh, way too thin. It's only 25,000 shares on average. Uh, I hear you it's headed higher, but look at this. Uh, it's very thin and choppy, so you probably need to wipe that off your radar. One of the problems with technical analysis is technical analysis, you're reading the mind of the market. You're reading the mind of the participants. But if you don't have enough participants, then technical analysis really doesn't work. You need a sampling that's big enough, a sample size that's big enough in order for the technical analysis to play out. And that's one of the things I never really think about mentioning. So you might want to write that down when it comes to technical analysis. So even though trading a thin stock, um, you shouldn't do it because it's thin in and of itself. There are other reasons, too. Uh, and one, one rogue trader can push the market around. COE. Uh, yeah, this is one that's on my radar as an IPO. We'll, we'll know it when we see it. Um, it's not set up just yet, though. We only have one, two, three. Oh, it is the fifth day. Uh, I have a rule that why you wouldn't take this trade on the on the, on the uh, fifth day plus buy at B trade, which I can't get into um, out of respect for those who have the course. Uh, but, yeah, keep this on your radar, but it's not ready yet. Okay. Uh, Mel wants to talk about X, which is going to be U.S. Steel. Um. The problem is that it took off, it came all the way back in, and now it's kind of bouncing back up. So it's there's no setup here for me. It would have to break out to new highs and then pull back. And it's not a short setup because when it comes to shorting, I'm not a big fan of shorting markets when they're way down here. I prefer to short them when they're coming off of major highs. I'm not trying to pick a top, but I'm looking for some sort of transitional pattern off of major highs and major lows. Hey, Dave, it took ACAIA. We're along that one. Hey, Dave, I took ACIA two hours ago. Pre IPO breakout. What do you think? Um, well, I think it, I think we're hitting the profit target is what I think. I think, huh? Anybody know what that is? Let's see. Uh, AC. Oops, you can see my setup. Ah. Look away, look away. <laughs> uh, what is it, 45.75? So 45.75, it tagged that profit target. Phil's going to say that my people stopped that stock. Phil, you in here? I saw you a minute ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's fine. I'm not a huge fan of breakouts, but as I discussed in the IPO course, there is a breakout characteristic when it comes to IPOs that's very tradable, and it's a great uh, – it's a great setup. Pause. That's going to be a silver stock. Uh, no, your net net change is sideways. So this is going to be a have to break out and then pull back for me to get excited about it. Yes, it hit and backed off. Yeah, so technically it's a... We did hit the profit target on that one. Art wants to know about RRR. That's the pirate's favorite stock. Arr. Well, when it comes to IPOs, um, one question, as I said in the course, you have to ask yourself, and I think that also, watch the intro video too. There's a lot, I hinted at a lot of good stuff in that intro video. So watch that. It's on my website on the uh, davelander.com slash trade IPOs. It's also on YouTube. And if I say so myself, there's a lot of good stuff in there. I wanted to give as much as possible away without giving everything away to, as kind of a big tease for the course. But one of the things that I said is, what's the story, fad, or glory? Now, the, the promise of an IPO, and that's what makes IPOs so great, it's a promise. You think that ACIA, I have no idea what they do, and they, they might not ever be successful at what they do, but... It's going higher, so there's, there's some excitement there. There's uh, 
R-E-T-A, one that I'm long, that's another one. There's some excitement there, okay? I don't know what they do, but there's some excitement there, okay, as a pure technician. But I could see Red Rock Resorts, eh, you know, what's the story? Is it some sort of fad or glory? So it doesn't necessarily have to be a biotechnology or an energy stock. It might be some sort of burrito maker or something that's pretty good. But with the resort, eh, I don't know. I have a hard time getting excited about that. So I'll take a little bit more of a show me approach instead of trying to get into that um, primary trade i'll look to get into a secondary trade primary trade would be like a short-term breakout after five days looking for a breakout hint hint okay that's a pattern right there write that down but instead let the stock prove itself and then maybe look to, to play a pullback now the stock really hasn't made that big of a move only about four points so far i guess it's okay so in this particular case instead of playing that first breakout i would wait and let the stock prove itself further and then look to, to play a pullback, okay? Sedona, Arizona. Did not take me out. Stopped exactly at 45, 75 by us, as you say, 37 Ks at the bar. <laughs> Phil seems to think that I have too many people in and I, I fully disagree. If you look at my prices, uh, you could hear crickets chirping most of the time. But Phil seems to be finding some some volume around there. So I'll pay attention to that, but I, I don't think it is. Sedona, Arizona. What's in Sedona? Oh, you just came back from Sedona. RRR. Oh, okay. How was it? How was the resort? Sedona is – I found Sedona by accident. It's it's awesome. Yeah, Red Rocks. Red Rocks, Red Rocks. <laughs> we did the Pink Jeep Tour. tour, tour, tour. Um. It was phenomenal. I would highly recommend you do it. Yeah, um, we were in, where were we, Albuquerque? And I was looking at uh, one of those um, brochures in the hotel or those little books, whatever, and I pointed to a rock that was on the back cover, and I said, I want to see that. And so we dug around the Internet, and I punched in red rocks, and Sedona came up, and next thing you know, we're in Sedona. Uh, beautiful. I love going out west. I I, if I'd ever, I never leave the office except for usually business travel, but uh, I need to take a load off and go. My ACIA order didn't get filled there. Phil must have taken all the orders. <laughs> Phil's pretty good at what he does, I tell you. All right, any more stocks? I know we're running. Uh, I know I ran late, so we're going to go a little bit more. Uh, anything else? While we're at an impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming. As you know, I love doing these shows. Thank you guys so much and girls for showing up today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. One last one for Arsene. Okay, MDU. Yeah, it looks good. Uh, nice way to end on a high note. It uh, needs a little bit more pullback, but certainly looks uh, decent. Let's back the chart way out, see what we have. Yeah, that looks fantastic. Put that on your watch list uh, for me to get excited. A little bit more pullback. But it has a lot of the makings of a good trade. So who said that? Arsene, good job. Nice little acceleration higher, a little bit more of a knockout. Okay. Okay, we're going to go ahead and wrap things up. I really appreciate, again, everybody coming, uh, guys and girls. A lot of girls today. Thank you, girls, for showing up. Hopefully I wasn't too rude and crude. Um, but, again, thanks, everyone. Any questions unanswered, daviddavelander.com. If we don't talk between now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. And hopefully we'll see everybody again next week. Thank you so much.